So, um, all right. So, guys, thank you for joining us this morning. I want to take a moment to think together to show you where we're headed related to building simulations and also to get your feedback, to get your thoughts. So I'm going to be running through some of these simulations and I'd invite you to take notes or to even stop me as we're going through the simulations to start putting in your feedback. I've got Matt, I've got David joining us. They're all part of the PhysioU team and um, we're, all, we're all testing and trying to figure out what is the best way to build this. So I hope that as I'm showing these different simulations that you will be able to feel free, open feedback. Uh, that's the kind of discussion that I'm hoping for. So um, just briefly, I've been teaching at APU for the last 17, 17 years. I teach exclusively now in the orthopedic series. And, um, and I love teaching to my core, which is why I invested so much time and energy in trying to figure out how to do this better, how to help all of us do this better, and then how do we, how do we pivot now that the grounds or the rules by which we teach have changed so much. So this really comes out of this my own self-searching for solutions because my students' learning is my top priority and I think that's, the, that's what draws all of us together. It's, it's a common thread for, for all of us. So just to couch the concept of simulation, so you see just a, 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 a glimpse of what we have here and I'll, I'll take you through them. The simulations are defined as techniques for practice and learning that replaces and amplifies real experiences with guided ones. So what I like about the, the sims is that we can provide feedback along the way. They're often immersive in nature that evoke and replicate substantial aspects of the real world in an interactive fashion. And I would say that this first level of simulations we're building is just the beginning of what we're exploring to build. It's just there is time, resources, and technology. Uh, all of these pieces have to come together in order for us to first build the first version, get your feedback, and then take it to the next level. As I was thinking through why is simulation-based learning so necessary today, one big thought that I think all of us have on our minds is the de decreased availability of clinical education sites. And with that in mind, are they getting the types of experiences, some of the more challenging ones, are they getting all of these experiences in their clinicals? Or could we augment the clinicals with very well-defined clinical experiences so we can predictably put students in situations challenging, some challenging, some not challenging, so that they will be properly exposed and prepared to serve the patient. The other thing that has significantly impacted me, and I'm sure many of you, is the decreased classroom time. So the luxury of running patient-based, student-based simulations has now all but disappeared. What will that look like at the end of your semester? I'm not sure what that'll look like at the end of my two semester orthopedic course when so much of that time was used for integration, case study based integration. So there is a need for increased exper experiential learning or to increase the experiential learning to develop entry level practice competencies. I think this is quite important. Not only do we want to see the skill, we want to know you can apply the skill. And then the need for low stakes asynchronous tools. Why low stakes? Because the students cannot handle high stakes right now. And I don't think that in learning, everything should be high stakes. I think along the way, there should be lots of low stakes environments for students to play, make decisions, make mistakes, learn from it, play it again. That's real learning. So we have to change the way that we, we craft clinicians by creating low stakes tools. So that's what I think simulations can be. And then systematic unpacking and application of learned content. So if you think about any orthopedic class, which is what I teach, within two weeks, they have probably accumulated 100, 150 tests, therapeutic exercises, um, uh, examination and treatment procedures. I mean, just any body region, you've got hundreds 
over 100 at least. So there's got to be a way for them to unpack it, use it and apply it so that they can now take ownership of the tools and then they can move on to the next body region. So that's how I see the way we use simulation-based learning. It's week by week. They have a chance to play every week. So Muir, I, I was doing a little bit of a literature, literature review. Muir in 2010 said, the benefits of simulation are we have enhanced student learning outcomes and it allows students to integrate knowledge and clinical re reasoning, uh, making real-time decisions based on the scenario that they face. And there's actually been quite a lot of this happening in a lot of the different other professions, nursing, pharmacy, and medicine. So I did a little literature review of, uh, and this is not com comprehensive, but I have a few systematic reviews related to physical therapy and occupational therapy. I mean, a lot of the therapy related professions. I wanna see what people are doing. So here they're talking about simulated patients. This is a 2016 article. And what I think is useful to take from this is that simulated patients, as we know, all of us know, it's just it's really hard to do now, is a, has, has an effect comparable to that of alternative educational strategies, may serve a valuable role in entry-level physical therapy education, and also helps with this development of physical therapy clinical practice competencies. So all the things we've been talking about. Um, here, Physiotherapy Canada, 2015, they talked about how simulators can provide feedback that helps students to learn specific skills. They talked about computer simulations that can augment the learning experience. That's what we are building. The human acute care simulations. So I was talking to our team who's running acute care classes this, uh, this semester, fall semester. We used to have hospital beds set up in this big room all of these different cases, the students are making decisions about lines and tubes, what interventions to do, uh, how to transfer the patient out of the bed, all of that unlikely to happen. So we do know that the human acute care simulations positively impact confidence, reduce anxiety, and that there's, the simulated learning environments can replace a portion or, uh, of a full-time four-week clinical rotation without impairing, impairing learning. So something for us to consider is will we ever be able to, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that we will be, be able to catch up for all, all of our clinical rotations. We're having a really hard time getting our students who need to graduate in December, getting their clinical hours. So perhaps one of the conversations we may need to visit over the next two years is how well can we build simulations? Can we study the simulations and eventually augment the clinical hours, perhaps replace some clinical hours with very well created learning objective defined clinical reasoning enhancing simulations? This is the direction that I'm thinking because I don't foresee, I mean, the ClinEd problem was, was rough before COVID, it's now I don't even know how to describe it for our ClinEd team. It's been really difficult to watch the struggle. Uh, and I think most of us uh, recognize that. Here uh, it, in this simulation in physical therapy education, this I believe was a commentary, they noted that simulations open the door for rich learning experiences. I, I believe that to be true and have the potential to achieve highest quality safe and interprofessional, which is another great opportunity for simulations, uh, interprofessional practice that future healthcare demand. Uh, so the one note that I saw in their, in their conclusion that I think is um, very clear to all of us is that simulations, even as a highly effective instruction tool, is resource and time consuming to create. I mean, we were building simulations even before COVID started. We have about 30 to 50 simulations that we are vetting right now because if you're gonna release it into the schools, they better be good. Um, they're extremely expensive and time consuming. Um, but I don't see a way around it. I think it's something that we need to explore. 
here in this uh, in this article, just looking at occupational therapy education, they did a survey of uh, 245 schools, and 71% of them were using simulations. Now, the simulations include human actors, students, video case studies. There's not a lot about computer-based simulations. I don't think most programs have had the opportunity or the resources to build these uh, because they're time consuming and very expensive. And then uh, these simulations are commonly used in intervention based courses. The common reported challenges from these programs was the time it took to bring in and train standardized patients or students or TAs, the cost to do this, and the scheduling issues. I mean, when we think about our own mentored evaluations where we run lots of evals, students are going through and doing the full evaluation, the treatment, the therapeutic exercises, the education, and we give them feedback. It is a very challenging thing to schedule. It is very costly and it's very difficult to scale. Uh, the technology can solve all of those problems. Eventually we'll all share the cost of the development but your ability to scale for every student to have their own one-on-one -on -one patient evaluation and treatment type experience, that can be done with the technology. Oh, and the last reported challenge, of course, we mustn't forget that now it's next to impossible to do all of these human actors, students, video case studies we can do for sure, right? But now it's a lot harder. We in PhysioU at at APU, we're thinking a lot about how to do this and how to do it safely. We considered it absolutely imperative that the students are able to try to, to treat, to evaluate, to make decisions, and to learn from those experiences. Um, these simulations, we hope, will become a part of a part of um, a part of entry level in our program, and if useful for yours as well. So, Dr. Wong, I got a quick question. Sure. Or the, the, on the chat, there's asked, will the, the recordings will be on the YouTube page? Yes, the recording will be okay. on the YouTube page, yep. And so so people who are attending this will have access to it as well? Will have YouTube. access to it as well, yep. And then, um, kind of on the SimLab thing, what do you think, what's a cost analysis, if you know, um, versus what you know we're doing with PhysioU and stuff, as opposed to Loma Linda's got a, a very large sim lab that used to just bring in the students, and the scheduling is the hardest thing, because a lot of other programs were using it. Yeah, uh, maybe Riverside's med students would come over there. What's it? Is it cheaper and more cost effective to do it like where with PhysioU than to well, to put together, it, I know I mean, the COVID thing, you can't go there anyway. So, yeah, well, yeah, that's one of the issues. I mean, we also have a sim lab in our nursing department that I'm not sure how much the physical therapy department has used. There is certainly, that's a very limited resource. I mean, that's almost like a modalities class. You only have enough, so many traction machines. And the cost of these, uh, these kind of um, simulation uh, tools, uh, the fake patients or the, um, you know, those simulation bots, so to, so to speak, quite expensive, difficult to man, and... Oftentimes, though they may simulate the acute care setting, very difficult to simulate all the other neuro patients, pediatric patients, orthopedic patients. That's why we are now experimenting, and I'll show you the simulation we're building for neuro. Can that actually have the students make the, the right decision, do the movement analysis? So we're learning. We're learning too. That's why I'm, I'm inviting faculty to be a part of this conversation. But I, I don't think, I don't think it, from a cost perspective, those types of labs are very difficult to scale. Not every program has them and not and everybody's using them. But a software-based solution can scale infinitely. And so I don't think they're even in the same ballpark in terms of accessibility or cost. Yeah, and that's something that Shelly put on the chat that they got bumped at St. Phil's College because of the nursing program. And I know Loma Melinda, the PT program, had difficulty getting into the university sim lab because med students and nursing and other folks, so they built their own. I mean, they, yeah, that's you know, that's their, great. Yeah, but now what we build could be specific to PT, neuro PT, ortho PT, peds, whatever. Yeah, that's right. I think this could be. I think this is eventually going to be far superior. Well, it, maybe not far superior. It will augment a very 
unattainable resource, which is a real sim lab. And here you can have students doing it week by week without any scheduling issues, right? So there's a lot of advantages. Maybe it's not exactly the same, but it's a step in the right direction. So one example of these simulations is a collaboration between us and University of Idaho. So I was just talking with a team who's building this, Dr. Brian Cleveley and Dr. Edie Kendall. So she's going to be testing their latest version of pediatric gait analysis so that their students are going to observe these different patients, do the gait analysis, and use the Edinburgh Visual Gait Score, and they're going to start scoring things. So I think this is one way to utilize simulation type technology to make a relatively complicated task of movement analysis and you gamify it. So this is coming to PhysioU, I'm hoping in the next month. We're getting really close and Edie's gonna be putting together a, a manual for faculty. How are you going to use this in class? And she's testing it with her students. So we tested it, a, a preliminary version of this in our pediatric class this past June. So it'll be fun. So this is just one example, not really the simulations that I'm gonna show you, but this is one of the types of technology. This is a simulation. This is a virtual reality clinic and you're using a very real tool, a validated tool to help students go through the process of movement analysis. So this is one, one way to look at how, how all of a sudden you don't have to have 20 kids walking back and forth in your little classroom. They can do this on their own, score it on their own. Okay, so I'm gonna take you into the neuro rehab sim here. So what you see in the neuro rehab sim, so there's a number of neuro faculty who are part of this. Um, Jamie O'Brien is one of the faculty who, are, who we're engaging in conversation with and we're thinking through these cases. So this is our first test. So Jerry Maguire is here for you to see them and here you're going through and doing a chart review and you can click on the tab of that chart and look at the different findings. Now certainly, you can already put in findings here and ask students questions. Is this, is this patient appropriate for you to continue care? So here the patient's showing you that I have a few different types of medications, Coumadin and Propanadol, I think, um, and uh, Propanadol, and please connect those. What you saw there is some interactions for the students. So can you recognize what medications the students are on? So this ties into your pharmacology class. And now based on the medications list, what is the impact that might have on your therapy? Oh, it's a blood thinner. It places your patient more at risk, right? So that's, again, the higher risk for bleeding right here. So the simulations in my mind aren't just a patient experience, but they are, there are forced stops where faculty can actually create questions. We are, we are working with faculty to create good questions to help students take a stop and to make decisions and integrate knowledge that they've been learning across the curriculum. Okay. So then here we move in to learn more about the patient. So meet your patient, Jerry. So Jerry is going to tell you a little bit of a story about how he had a stroke three months ago. And this is how we've decided that we're going to release information in small little bits. So here's his history of present illness. What type of stroke do you think the patient had? What type of CVA? How long after the initial symptoms can the patient receive a TPA? And so you can intersperse uh, little questions, you can in intersperse like basic knowledge based questions and then you'll see later that there's like movement analysis questions. So here's his social history. Works as a truck driver. What are some of the challenges related to his living situation? Well he lives in a two-story house so you're you're cluing the student in to the information that they've been given and helping them dr draw out critical pieces of information. So he has fatigue, he's a truck driver, he used to walk two miles a day, did his own yard work. So let's take a look at his goals because the goals will inform the interventions and the testing. 
So he wants to be able to walk from the entrance of the soccer complex so he can watch his grandson play soccer. So we move on in the case. We'll ask the students to interpret. What short-term goal would you like to set for the patient? Right, based on what the patient has told you. Well, I think the patient needs to be able to walk 10 feet independently without assisted devices or without loss of balance. Here is the, the decision that we've made, and this is, I would invite all of you to give us some comments. If you think about a simulation, can you afford for a simulation to be a half hour long, right? I don't think we can afford that time. So we decided that for the objective exam, there's actually gonna be a question before this. The question is, what are the different types of things you would like to examine? So the students can actually drag and drop different like muscle strength, muscle length, range of motion, gait and balance. So they can drag and drop an evaluation and then here we are thinking of releasing the information in little pieces. So as you hover over different parts, different bubbles, they will learn about coordination, heel to shin, some neuro test, Babinski's positive, They'll learn about some vitals, some range of motion findings, some strength findings. So this is a compromise for sure, but you just saved yourselves 10 minutes of questions. Now, I think it's important to ask the students, what kind of things do you feel like you should investigate? But how you deliver that information this is how we've we've decided to try it because this model will fit very similarly to our orthopedic simulations. It's the same flow because the students can then learn to play these simulations more efficiently. It's because the way that we deliver information is similar. All right, so I'm going to move on here. I think this is another couple minutes. So what kind of synergy pattern is the patient uh what, what, which of the following best describes the patient's synergy pattern? Certainly this can be augmented with a picture or a video. All right, you're now ready to begin some functional testing. So let's take a look how this patient performs a sit to stand. Again, what we're doing is we will be filming a number of different patients and we will build the simulation around them. So we will have their timed up and go findings. We'll have their balance, other balance test. Their, we may show a video of their coordination or their tone. So let me stop this for a second right here. Based on the video you just saw, so let me go back one second. And the patient initiates a sit to stand with a right lateral weight shift. What impairment do you feel like contributes most to this patient's problem and so decrease abdominal strength was the answer that we're looking for okay so uh, how can I ask a question about this sure please hey it's Teresa from University of Minnesota hi um, Teresa hey um so would the order in which we could select these vary or do we kind of have to follow through in order of what the simulation would allow. For example, I would maybe want my students to see that sit to stand video first <clears throat> and then decide what objective tests they might want to do based on the movement. So could I do that? Could I have yeah. them look, go and look at the functional movement first? I would say that the way that these software authoring softwares work, there is no flexibility. Okay. So that's why the conversation has to happen now or okay. as we release beta versions of it the feedback you'll give us is like, hey, could we do functional movement assessment early before the official objective testing question? So I think that's that's a really, I mean, exactly exactly what you said is the same feedback that Jamie, Jamie had when we were looking at this in the first round. So um, if you think about how we generate these, they are going to be, they are lock-stepped because there's a, it's almost like a um, decision tree 
this answer takes you to this slide. That answer will take you to a different slide. There's a lot of things that you cannot shift around or the whole system is messed up. So yeah, okay. yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, I'll make a point. I mean, certainly you're already part of the conversation. So as we begin to roll these out more, um, there will be a core group. And for those of you who are interested, I would be happy to invite you into the group that contributes to the timing of certain things. Um, like what kind of questions or tests did we want to show? You know, I think if you see what we're doing here, like here's your Berg balance score. Please interpret these scores. Is Jerry a fall risk or not? Nope, Jerry's not a fall risk, but he needs to improve his functional balance. So what are some other tests that you can use that may be relevant to him and his, his end goals? The other thing that I think we have to think about is how hard do you want to make these questions? The risk is low, technically, so um, but yet, there's a fine balance for helping students deal with the information that is floating around in their head, find victory along the way as they're going through these simulations. You don't want to make them so hard that they dread going to the next one. So there's a fine balance between learning, making mistakes, and victory, I think, that we have to balance as we're doing this. So. Here we're asking the students to identify some primary impairments and then to start looking at, based on the exam, what are some goals. Now we can make more realistic goals. Patient will ambulate for 50 feet over uneven surfaces. And what treatment would you like to perform? So it would be nice that when they click on the appropriate treatment that we can show a video of that treatment on the patient and then show another couple of videos perhaps of how the patient now in the reassessment how they've changed maybe their functional movement has now improved maybe some of their objective tests are now Im improved so that's just a sample let me just stop here for a minute and get some feedback from 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 the call from all of you any comments about the neuro rehab simulation Mike, on the chat, Caroline Rogers wrote that uh, the neural um, had a uh, seemed to be very orthopedically oriented. And maybe Caroline can come yeah. on and talk and explain more what she's thinking about. I would say, Caroline, that the people who are driving the development of the neurosims has, uh, like, are not are all neuro professors, but it's the first iteration. And we've leveraged some of the things that we learned and we built in the first 40 sims that we built, which are the orthopedic sims. We reuse certain components as a test. And then we will, re, we will reshuffle. We'll re make new icons based on the neuro professor's feedback. So yes, it, though it feels, their components of it are like, you know, the way you organize that objective exam slide, that feels really ortho. Well, we did it because it's what we had initially, and it gave us enough of a, of a version to now iterate off of. So it's, it's really just the beginning, and we still have yet, we have a lot of neuro patients that we filmed already, but if you think about it, we are probably going to build each simulation in, its, in a first version, and then we'll go and take the patients and film, refilm everything that we need to make the simulation really robust. This platform is called SimTutor. Right now what we're using is a platform called SimTutor. There are some benefits to using SimTutor and there's some cons to using it. I'm not sure if we're gonna be using it forever, but it's it's enough for you. you have, it's a paid subscription and it's a little bit clunky and there's a few things as we're learning to build Sims that we may or may not be able to overcome. So we are looking at many different simulation softwares. Alyssa mentioned, what did Alyssa mention, James? It looks like the Aly very oriented toward PT programs. No, actually, Alyssa, a lot of the sims, we have already been building some of the um, PTA sims. So they start from the second visit onwards. There's a lot of decisions that PTAs need to make, and I'm building that with PTA instructors as well. So we are, we're focused on supporting both. 
Lori mentioned with regard to the difficulty of questions. Right. Yeah. So that's that's a good point. Using Bloom's, Bloom's taxonomy might be a good way to s kind of scale the number of questions that we have, and the nu and the level of questions. So that's that's a great point. Any other comments? Uh, Mike, I have a question. When you're, I, I realize this is beta test mode or whatever, but when you're scrolling over the answers, they're highlighting green or red, which you can clearly see. What what actually happens in the oh real format if someone gets a wrong answer yes so in the right what i showed you was learn mode learn mode prompts the students to the right answer in test mode you just hover over and you get no response you just have to choose something and then when you choose something if you're wrong we can route you to a wrong message here's why you're wrong if you choose the right one it moves you on to the next step so the reason why I show you that is because there's so many sims, I don't even remember. So I use the learn mode as a way to navigate it quickly. But typically in the test mode, which is what the students will be playing, it will not reveal what's right and what's wrong until you click on it. And the, what they click on is recorded. So you can begin to see trends of where students are making wrong decisions. But that also ties to another project that the whole team met last night to talk about, which is how do we help faculty see what their students are making decisions about? It's super complicated. It's on our list. Does that answer your question, Andrew? Yes, thank you. You got it. Mike, real quick, um, on the PTA kind of thing, um, and you answered it, but I don't know if it was still yet clear enough, but do you anticipate a, a set of sims for PTA and then PT? or? Are the sims going to be allowed where the instructor can modify it or use it for both of those audiences? There will be specific sims for PTA group and specific sims for PT group, but the sims themselves, you really don't want to go into the back end of these sims. They're super complicated to build. They, I mean, there, there's a lot of work that goes into linking things. And so there, as of right now, it's impossible for us to, I mean, it's even a headache for us to go in and change the Sims. That's why it's it's so labor intensive. But there will be separate sets. Michael, there's one more question here from Michelle talking about um, can we use questions besides multiple choice questions? Any short answers or open response like questions? Yes, I believe the simulations have the ability to do some like just type in your thoughts, open so uh, open ended questions. Or they have lots of little interactions that I, for example, when you looked at the medications, Coumadin, could you drag and drop the appropriate medication to its description? There's lots of these types of little interactions that are usable. Um, multiple choice is not the only option. So what I'm showing you here is just a glimpse of our simulation slash learning module for ionophoresis. So I wanted this selfishly so that the students after they've learned their modality offline online with you on the weekend they could play through this and relearn it they could explore it again so what we did is we made sure that a lot of the equipment the students could actually explore the equipment and the buttons because this is a critical part for their learning that's really hard to do over zoom i mean honestly it was really hard to do face to face anyway I want them to be able to play with it on their own time at their own pace. All right, so I'm going to take you to, let's see, click to proceed. Go ahead, this is another example. Go ahead and drag and drop. Okay, so I'm going to clean the patient's skin. I'm going to place the medication on the active electrode. I'm going to place the electrode on the patient, and I'm going to adjust the desired intensity. Okay, so there's different little interactions like this. I'm gonna take you further in to show you that there can be things like, hey, please, you know that um, this is the case study here. So this is the actual simulation. Let me see if I can get us there. So here's a summary of what you've learned. Here's your contraindication precaution review. Okay, your different polarities of your electrodes. the active electrode, the dispersive electrode. Don't forget to check the skin. So all these little parts. 
And now, your patient has carpal tunnel syndrome. Which electrode do you place over the carpal tunnel? Okay, so here's all your different devices, your different medications. Sorry, let me click on that. So your common medications. And eventually, you get to the game. So the game is probably here. Great job, let's, let's meet your patient. So your patient is complaining of lateral epicondylosis or epicondylalgia. So again, we'll probably change that. Go ahead and click all your contraindications. So they're gonna have to learn this. Eventually, Andrew, they're not gonna be able to see the, the greens and the reds. The cool part is, why don't we, we ask them, can you put the patient in a comfortable position? They're gonna be seated on a chair, their arm resting comfortably on a table. What medication is likely to have been prescribed? So what medication with, did the physician most likely prescribe for this inflammation since you have redness and swelling? So dexamethasone, she only has 20 minutes for treatment. What kind of amplitude would you need to get your 40 milliamp minutes? Okay. Go ahead and click on your active electrode. And now, please turn up. Right? Please turn up the amplitude to match what you've said. So, again, you can see I'm trying to create a little bit of overflow for the motor skill. So they kind of get used to it, they can visualize it, they saw it, they tried it in lab, they can try it again. This is one of the features that SimTutor provides. Um, it's one of the reasons why I chose SimTutor, yet there are other reasons why I may eventually move away from SimTutor, but for now, it's good enough for us for the first round. So that's kind of how, um, you can imagine, ionophoresis, where would you put, or sorry, um, uh, IFC, interferential current, where would you put the pads? Can you make sure the pads have a cross pattern, right? A quadrupolar placement. Um, these types of little interactions, these simulations can build. So let, I'm going to stop here just for a second and ask any thoughts or comments about physical agents type of simulation. Okay, awesome. So keep keep the feedback coming. We are we have now finished all the simulations for physical agents. We are now trying to figure out the best way to host it because it's really expensive. Um, but we want to provide it for the students, and so we're they're they're ready, they're vetted. We fixed it. We've gone through it with a number of faculty. Uh, I'm hoping by fall that it will be available. Um, as usual, as it comes to tech, it's always easier for me to dream it than it is to build it, and and a lot of the other headaches of uh, headaches of trying to get it. Deli to deliver it, deliver it to faculty. So here's wound care. So we thought about how are we going to do wound care because in the MPTE, in the board exams, it's generally a poor scoring area. And so we decided that actually um, the best way to help students integrate this information is to play the game. Michael, can I stop you just for a second yeah. real quick? Go for it. Real too late questions regarding physical agents and before we get away from there. Mm -hmm. uh, have you built in any adverse reaction kind of components to the physical agents? Yes. And, and then which physical agents, uh, what's the suite, what's the A to Z? What's oh, the, you know what? Um, you let know me my, see. <sighs> Hard to say. Hang on. Um, you know, we all the major ones. Heat, ice, NMES traction, ultrasound, paraffin, ionophoresis, TENS, hot pack, IFC, HVPC, ice massage, cold pack. I mean, the bulk that you need, we've done. So, yeah, I hope that helps. What was the first question, James? Adverse reactions. Oh, adverse reactions, game. yes. In the bulk of the simulations, the games, we have built in something did not go right. Please make a decision of how to address this. Should you stop the treatment? Should you add layers of towels? Should you, like, what should you do? So, you know, we, we built that with, it, with that in mind, that 
almost always things don't go the way we want it. So we want to create situations where students have to troubleshoot. And you know, it's been great. The conversations we've been having with the PTA faculty and the PT faculty is, yes, it's great that the students are learning to use this, but it would be even better if you could always make something go wrong so that we can help them navigate this in a safe environment so that they are ready to deal with it when they come to treating the real patients. Michael, there's one more question here. Um, somebody, uh, Valerie asked, have we used, um, how have clinical practice guidelines, you know, guided what uh, modalities are being incorporated? Are we using ones only with high levels of evidence or using sort of ones with even less, with little less levels of evidence? What sort of, has that? Um, that is, wow, that's a great question. Not an easy question to answer. So I would say that the modalities that we built SIMS for, we've, we built them because they were the ones that we are teaching. And all of us know that among the spread of modalities, some have terrible evidence, some have just plain out weak evidence, and there probably isn't that much bigger, not much more beyond that. It kind of like not very good evidence and then bad evidence against it. So ultimately though, we built the simulations, the cases to simulate common patient, patient sim, uh, situations I haven't even gone back to rethink through to stratify the simulations in that way. But whoever sent that comment in, would you please reach out to me at mike at physiou.com and so we could chat about that. I need to wrap my head around what you're thinking about so that it can help guide, guide further development. So I love that comment. Michael, this is Valerie. Oh, hi, Valerie. Uh, hey. So we kind of run into the same issues when we're, you know, trying to teach modalities and teach them well. And then we get into some of our higher level clinical classes. And then, uh, so I was just thinking maybe, because there is evidence for Definitely. some modalities recommended in CPGs that maybe if you chose the cases carefully that you created to ones that end up having decent know, evidence. evidence for them would be... Um, especially helpful that's what we're trying to do in our curriculum is be more intentional about the cases that we choose when we're teaching the modalities that's perfect and i know as i've watched um some of my colleagues paul minkin um and colorado they are being really careful about that too i love that integration right so instead of just creating random cases create really high impact cases so here in our ortho app under the interventions you have modalities and the guideline says that there's C-level evidence for diathermy, ultrasound, and electrical stim for a frozen shoulder. So this perhaps should inform the types of case studies that we present because it kind of links it better together. So yeah, point well taken. I, I would love to talk more about that with you. Um, let me take you quickly through a wound care sim. So you're going to see some images here that are inconsistent, right? The next few images are actually a hip trochanter issue, but we are just grabbing images because we're testing. Can we do what we want to do? So this is not production ready. It is my experiment, just so, so everybody um, is hopefully is okay with that. So here you see the wound and you're being asked potentially to try to stage it. What type of wound might it be? And how are you going to figure out more what you're going to do next? Well, I probably need to debride the wound to determine the stage. So go ahead and grab the appropriate piece of equipment, drag it over to the wound. And now this is what the wound looks like. So remember, uh, this is just me experimenting with different types of ways to unlock the content that they've been taught into experiential learning into playable components. So here is my slough. Here is my granulation tissue. And then here is my epibole. So as you go through the game, you say, hey, I need to continue debridement. I see the yellow slough. Now this is what you see. Let's go ahead try to stage it and start taking measurements. 
So little things that we have to fix here. Let's measure the height of the wound. Let's measure tunneling. Okay, now that you've measured the tun tunneling, let's actually measure it. So there's lots of little things that we can do to actually help the students actually go through the process, right? How many of our students are actually gonna make it to a wound care clinic? Well, we can build wound care simulations that will cover the most common wounds, walk them through the common steps of the evaluation, and eventually, help them make decisions about dressing. So how would you like to dress the wound? Go ahead and apply the appropriate dressing. So that's just a quick glimpse. I would love to get some comments, any thoughts. That's what, the, this is just our experiment with wound care. We are right now filming wound care sessions with different types of wounds, different types of dressings. We have maggots, we have all the cool stuff, <laughs> right? So why not, I mean, why not? So um, any comments about the wound care? Sims. Can I ask a question about sure. the, um, so it's really interesting how you kind of gamified it. Um, and so like the measuring, is it, um, you know, is it wrong if they, is it right because you choose the measuring device or is it, is it also grading you on where you place it on the wound? So it helps them figure out where the, oh. the wound edges are. Yeah, you could do it that way because when we set up the parameters for what is considered correct, mm -hmm. um, you can set the, the, the borders that you require the, the, the ruler to go onto before they can move on. Now, that can be really frustrating. Imagine if you didn't have all my little learning yet green prompts. Right, right. You're just like, why is this not letting me move on? So that's another challenge. Now, the other way to do it is you, you make a uh, multiple choice question. What was the, the finding? And you have a number of different readings. One is you measured it too wide. One is that you measured on the inside. And so that is, I think, the mechanism that would, you would use. And if they choose the wrong one, maybe we'll show an image of the ruler overlaying the wound again and then show them why the right answer was, here's where you're supposed to measure from here to here. That's brilliant. That's yeah. a really good idea. So I think that's the way that, to do it because when we played this, so I've been testing this in some of my students, and when we turn it into test mode, it, became, it can become a nightmare of inability to progress forward. I didn't put the ruler exactly where you thought you should put the ruler. You know, like, and then before you know it, the students tapped out. They're like, I'm not interested. This game is no fun. You know? Yeah, good. Yep. Uh, the, the other thing I would say about, about um, wounds that I think sometimes is tricky, well, with a lot of things, I think, for what we do, is that there isn't a ton of great evidence that says this modality versus that modality. Yes. Um, for wound treatment. And so, you know, being able to have some discussion on there are maybe multiple right answers, but there's maybe one or two wrong answers is kind of important with wounds because yeah. often people use the modality that they have in the clinic. <laughs> right, right. That's very true. I think we can, because this is virtual, we can actually have them apply different modalities and show them why that might be a decent answer, why that might be a wrong answer. So that can be built into the system. It's a good point. I'll make sure that as uh, the wound care specialist, Shelly Swen, um, she, she, as we're building these out, that we'll have that in mind because you're right. Um, it's not clear cut. What's the perfect answer? And I don't want to take anybody's time up anymore, but I would say the other thing that we found our students are a little uncertain about are um, proper incisional wound healing. Mm. So when is it infected? When, it, when am I worried about the redness? Um, and so I've, uh, yeah, kept cornered a bunch of family members who have had surgery and started taking pictures of their scars, right, or their, their incisions because, because that's often like in an orthopedic clinic where they might see that wounds. <laughs> totally. That's a very good point. In fact, we should just create a module for that. You know, patient that comes in after really their total knee. For yeah, patient comes in. Matt, if you'd make a note of that, you know, 
a common orthopedic, you know, post ACL repair? How many students are seeing that, you know, or a total knee? Or knee replacement, because older adults tend to hold um, one edema a lot longer. I, I oh, think. I love it. You know, what's redness around the wound is normal. When is it abnormal? Yeah. And I think, I think this idea about general healing times, abnormal healing, it would be great in the wound care, some of these wound care simulations as things are not going well, that you can talk about comorbidities, how they may affect healing. You've got all of these opportunities to tease that out. So I think that's, that's all great thoughts. Inflammation versus infection, yeah, that's great. So in the orthopedic sims, um, and I'm going to open it up right now for comments and questions as I kind of show little glimpses of the orthopedic sims because we're kind of, out of getting close to out of time. This is the last simulation I was going to show. I'm just going to point out a couple of things different that we did for the orthopedic sims. This is the first set of sims that we started building. I want to show you that um, we did the same kind of thing, except we added in outcome measures. So for every simulation for orthopedic condition, we are pushing the students to recognize what is the common outcome measure and to interpret it, because I don't think we do that well enough. So you can see that there's some interpretation because as the sim goes on, the outcome measure will change and the students need to determine are they making progress? Is the progress significant? Um, all of that is how we train the students to really integrate outcome measures into clinical practice to make decisions off of it. The other thing that I would say if I take us to the end, towards the end of the sim, is if you choose inappropriate interventions, the patients will get worse. And if you choose the appropriate interventions, the patients get better. So that's the value of the low risk learning. And eventually we come to the point where the patient, the patient comes back day two. So here is, let me take a look, let me find that here. So we've made the simulation in such a way that, uh, Dr. Wong, can you reshare your screen? Oh, sorry about that. Yes. So what I was saying about the orthopedic sim is that we have integrated now all the outcome tools so that as you are learning about each patient, a knee patient, a shoulder patient, the student is going to have to recognize the outcome measure and make interpretations of the scores and how the score is changing over time. The patients get better and worse depending on your choice of intervention. So you say, hey, the patient's pain did not change. The exercise feels too easy. What should you do? Pick another home exercise program selection. So that's the nice thing. You can make right and wrong answers and give them immediate feedback about, you know what, that was just the not the right impairment. You started strengthening them, but they still had range of motion loss. So now their knee is all swollen. You need to take care of range of motion first. So there's this type of reasoning that we're building into the game. I would say that every one of these orthopedic sims has a week to a second visit. So the evaluation ends and the return visit begins. And so the students are asked to ask questions or they're given information about the common things that they would need to reassess and then they're asked to regress or progress interventions based on the patient's improvements or, you know, or the patient's inability to improve. A lot of the second visit part of the simulation, we're remodeling that for all the PTA decision making, all the unique situations that the PTA will find themselves in. So these simulations are not far different from the, the neurosim, information's delivered in small bits. There's multiple choice questions about their interpretation of the data. We allow them to choose treatment strategies and give them feedback about their dosage, about their patient, the, the positioning of the therapist. There, there may be pictures of how the therapist is performing the technique. Um, that may be wrong and we can ask them to interpret why is it could how could you do this treatment better so all of that is in my mind um, but we have built you know um, the bulk of our simulations have been built around 
the the orthopedic setting because it's where I could build the most fastest. We have we are in the process right now of building acute care sims. You can see the beginnings of the neuro sims. We will eventually do some pediatric ones, some cardiopulmonary ones, but you can see that we're covering almost all the common orthopedic conditions. So whiplash, Achilles tendon repair, some post-op stuff, shoulder instability, related leg pain, like all of the guideline-based conditions we are building simulations for, um, and, and some, and more. So I want to stop there so that we would have, with whatever few minutes we have left, for people to just feel free. If you, if you need to leave, thank you so much for being a part of this, but I'm happy just for us to chat to get some of your reflections. Matt has put together actually a couple of questions that, that um, let me go here. How are you currently using SIMS in your curriculum? Is it formative or summative or both? And in the ideal world, how would you use simulations in your curriculum? So maybe I would just throw that out there first. Some open comments. This is open for comments and also related to some of these questions. Dr. Wong, there's some uh, just practical questions that just popped up. Sure. So um, for the students who are um, already using PhysioU, they've already bought their subscription for the fall, will these simulations be included or will there be an additional cost for them? No, the simulations we are going to include, meaning... Now, I would say that eventually PhysioU, which is now at $54 a year, will probably be at $69 a year because the cost of creating these and hosting these is it's it's quite high but even at $69 a year you can imagine that to be it, it, it I don't think that that it's very expensive but all of these simulations we've decided to not make it a in-app purchase you need to buy this it for everyone who's already bought their subscription now all of these sims will just become part of their life it will just be updated into the system so I and hope. Then one, yeah. And then one last question is, um, uh, Christina asked about institutional pricing, and so I don't know if you want to get into how the pricing works. Yeah. Um, right now, there there is no major institutional pricing. Meaning, if if a institution wants to purchase PhysioU for their students, you can feel free to reach out to me. I can direct you to that. The students pay for their own subscription, or the or the program says, I have fifty students. I want to buy fifty codes for them. And then we and then we invoice the the program. So there's there's different ways to do it. Um, you could always reach out to me at mike at physiou.com. Awesome. Okay. Now yep. we can yeah. So any other some comments? How have you been using simulations, and what do you need, and what do you see from what we're building that could be improved? And make sure you unmute yourself. Any comments? Hi, Mike. It's Tony. Are you there? Yeah. Hi, Tony. Uh, so, great ideas. I love it. Um, I guess a couple of feedback comments initially for what you're looking for. Um, I really like the idea of incorporating decision making into what you're doing here. I like the drag and drop concept. Yeah. I think it's sick, but it still allows them to go ahead and make decisions, which I think is a huge part of what we learned. And we're unaware on what the students actually do when it comes to the sim. So I think introducing them to that concept um, via that drag and drop concept is great. And I like the, the motor, learning, motor learning component of the modalities um, portion where they actually have to go through and fiddle with the devices. Yeah. I'm trying to think in my head if there's a way to it can possibly rep be replicated for other types of techniques, which I would imagine would be challenging from a virtual situation. But I think that the whole concept of trying to replicate the motor portion is great. It's kind of cool. You know, for example, yeah. we made a sim where the, the therapist was doing an anterior to posterior mobe of the shoulder for a tight posterior capsule. And so we'd have them drag the mouse and the mouse would move the therapist's hand and they would be doing AP glides. So yeah, that's what I was kind of thinking was, could you could you maybe like do multiple arrows and pick an A, B, and C direction or something? That's kind of along the same lines as I was thinking. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Yeah, it can be done. It's limited in its, like, eventually it's no longer cool. If you do too many of them, they're just like, oh, I drag the mouse, it, moves, it bends the knee, cool. But 
there's a fine balance between interactions, animations, and not cluttering the entire experience. So you have to pick and choose what is it that you really, really want them to experience. So I think that's one of the considerations that we go through when we think about what animations to build. Go ahead, Tony. Feedback was, I think, um, anything that you can portray an observation of a movement or something happening in which the student has to make a decision is very valuable to what I would like to portray with the students. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's... Seeing things is difficult to replicate unless you do a sim. It's, it's really hard to to actually show them normal versus pathological, which I know you're working on. Yeah, I think... Um, there's a lot of functional movements that we should film. I think the important thing is usually it's important to build the sim first. And then as you're thinking through all the things you need, you go and film them all in one fell swoop. You know, Does that make sense? Because you can't afford to just build one, film something, build two, film something. That's why we spent all this effort to build the first version so that faculty can eventually start looking at it and we can start learning from what we built in the first round. There's product never, especially educational product, never iterates itself into its final product from the get-go because you never know what you think you can do or what you can't do until you do the first version. But I love the idea, the neuro, the neuro um, sim was the first time we were like, hey, let's integrate some videos of patients and have the students interpret that and see how that drives their decision making. So I'm very invested in making sure that that happens. You can imagine filming right now is quite difficult, but that's why we're spending a lot of time beta testing and building prototypes so that when we can start filming, we have all the prototypes built. Now we know exactly what we want to film. So I think just if I could end with a question, um, and I think it actually is somewhat in regards to that first bullet point that you put up on your, your last PowerPoint slide there um, in regards to formative versus yes. summative. So, and, and I think you answered it based on Andrew's question in regards to, you know, what are you actually trying to accomplish with um, the learning versus the testing? And it sounds like you're doing both, which seems like an astronomical task sort of. So. Just so I'm completely clear, so we can uh, guide your feedback appropriately, you're looking to achieve both, actually a learning version, which will give them pop-ups and teach them versus a choose your own adventure and they have to pick things which will more or less test them. So I guess in my mind, that would have been when you clicked on strength, then something would open up like MMT, mm -hmm. strengthening, functional screening kind of thing, which are more testing in nature versus what you showed was more learning in nature. Right. And, and, and so is that, is that I think correct? I see the simulations selfishly as a formative tool for now because okay. I see it fitting in well there. It's, it's asynchronous. It can happen on a weekly basis, and I don't have to worry about grades. As a summative tool, eventually when we make sure that these sims are played, we play them out, no one has questions about them. They're, they're rock solid. Now you can transition them to being summative tools so that we can now use them for testing of competencies, of, of clinical reasoning, of one day perhaps replacing some clinical hours. So yes, for both. But for now, I don't think faculty want the... That I don't think we have the capacity right now to trust the tool completely. So better to allow it to be in its beta form in it, as a formative tool. Students can do it on their own. And you know that they're going to be in the ballpark. Like a lot of the answers, they're going to be right because the, ans the kind of multiple choice questions we gave them, they're not hard because I didn't want to make it hard. I I'm just trying to get them on the right track. The summative version probably should be harder. So think of it as products that are in different phases of their, of their development, but also in our discovery of how to make them good and then eventually how we can research them so that we could have confidence in, in them as summative and grade, like gradable tools that can help in, inform a patient's grade. Because once you start using these to put in your gradebook, 
students could pass or fail depending on the simulation. So that there's a lot of um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to make sure that these are rock solid. You know. Gotcha. Yep. All right. Any other comments? Thoughts. what you might be looking for for your class. Just uh, kind of the administration thing, uh, timeline for me and all these and or, and then you touched on the cost and yeah. the ways the way the, uh, it can get accessed by individuals. So for the cost, for faculty, you will have every, all faculty have full access to PhysioU. We're happy to support you in your teaching. The students support the development, continued development of all of this content with their subscriptions. Um, the the uh, release of the modality sims, this morning we were already playing with them in a new learning management system. It's You don't have to worry about whether it matches your lear learning management system or not because we're building it into PhysioU. So students who log into PhysioU will be able to access their modality simulations. Um, so with that in mind, I guess, uh, when will they be released? I suspect before fall semester, which is really aug late August, we will have the, uh, the modalities physical agent sims available. And then as the orthopedic sims, as orthopedic sims become fully vetted, they will start trickling in. So we won't release them one at a time. I think we'll release them in little chunks. Um, but again, we ask for your patience as we as we try to do this right. Um, and my life is going to look very different in about th four weeks, which has me honestly a little bit um, nervous. But uh, we have a big team that's working on this and we're working as hard as we can because we know that how important this is for us, for us and our students. So I'm hoping that the, the physical agent sims will be a bit available by fall. The orthopedic sims will probably be throughout fall, releasing throughout fall semester, uh, because selfishly I want to use it for my class, so you could kind of tie it to my own <laughs> selfish desires. The neuro sims, the, Teresa is part of the conversation. Um, Jamie's part of the conversation. For those of you who want to be a part of the conversation, please reach out. I'd love to have you uh, involved in... In, in, in the development. I mean, we basically talk through these cases, create questions along the way, dream about what videos we'd like to put in there, and we build the story. We build the storyboard, and then the team takes a stab at building it. So there are many pieces. I, I, I'm hoping that you get a sense of how massive and challenging this project is. Um, but hey, that's what we love to do. So. Any other comments or questions? Hi, Mike. This is Lori. Hi, Lori. Um, so, yeah, we, as we talked about, I'm still looking, you know, hoping to maybe use something on the acute care side, you know, yes. with whatever that we can maybe try to start working on, you know, towards the acute care side. So, Lori, we, um, I met with our acute care instructor. I met with some of our team. We are currently, we've built our first acute care paper case. With the, with the scenario, the pictures, the questions, that will become the storyboard for the simulation. So after this first one is vetted, then we'll go, yes, that's the format that I like. Please build the other five cases, right? The total knee replace, the total hip replacement person, the person right after they're, you know, they're, they had a stroke and now they're, they're in the acute care setting. So I took the our conversation to heart, and the next day I got the team building. But it it will come in iterations. The first iteration will be the paper cases that actually will probably release into PhysioU as usable cases, and then on the in the back end we'll be building the sims and trying to figure out how we're going to film this. Awesome. Yeah. So yeah, it's I'm coming. Totally plan on using some of the other stuff that you're have already got going, but um, I for the good of the group, I just thought it might be helpful. To we are already talking about the acute care. Yep. Awesome. Mike Marcy is asking about jurisprudence simulations. Are they in production? Yes. So the same ex exploration that we've been doing with, um, so James is online. James has been trucking away, 
getting the jurisprudence simulations. Now, the jurisprudence simulations, we, we're trying to figure out how to set it up. Um, the jurisprudence courses, they're actually courses. They're not really simulations. They are likely going to be a separate thing, but they're very robust. We have finished California. James, do you remember which ones we have finished? Um, about, not off the top of my head. I had to look them up. I think we've talked about California, Maine, no, Arkansas, New Hampshire, um, New Hampshire, Arkansas, Texas. Um, yeah, Texas is done. Um, and so we've got to just get the the computer side of you know get them all onto there. Yeah. As you go through and the, and the challenge and the driver for us to do this. And this is kind of my background in terms of health policy stuff. That that about uh, twenty percent of the students who take the jurisprudence exam for those jurisdictions that have a jurisprudence exam for initial licensure don't pass in California. Over a two-year span of 6,000 people taking the test, 1,600 did not pass it. So those are people who can't practice. I mean, so yeah. So I think it's important for us to get this done for the students, and yeah. the programs, and then to then, and then to help them out because I think you know everyone wants to be an ortho neuro stuff. And it's like, oh, we got to do health policy and, and laws and regs. Uh, you know, it's like short end of the stick. Who got the short end of the stick in the faculty to teach that class? Yeah. So oh, I would say that probably by the end of the year or earlier. California, we will be running California. Like I, I remember talking with Mandy uh, about, hey, can we run the jurisprudence with your students to get feedback? So we're going to test it first. And then once we're happy with it, then we will release it to the larger group. And I mean, the implications are pretty large. If you think about jurisprudence and that there's an exam tied to it. So we got to do it right. But I will tell you that it's looking really good and the way we've organized the content in our LMS is really clean. It's going to be a great way for your students to learn about laws and regs for their state. We will have it for every state that needs it. That needs it. The, the challenge, the only challenge with that is like a you know frozen shoulder in Texas is the same in California as it is in Arkansas and New Hampshire. But unfortunately, you got to almost write fifty different apps. There's fifty different kind of versions. Modules. Of the same. Yeah. Because you know how many aides can you supervise, and how long you get to keep records, and ex the other the, the different things are, are in the different state boards. Texas has three uh, regulatory bodies. California has two. You know, so I'm I'm I should go back to law school, I think. Yeah. yeah. Any other comments? And Mandy, I saw your comment. Um, we yeah. will figure out a, a way to get those simulations available for some faculty to play with. The one thing too is um, I put um, Professor Wong's email in the chat, so it's Mike at physiou.com. Yeah, like that slide didn't pop up, so yeah, so everyone has your has any contact information if you had anything. Right. Any other comments? I want to yeah. think. Yeah, go ahead. Mike, uh, I didn't want to hog the time earlier, but if nobody's going to ask any questions, go for I'll it. Ask so as far as I understand that initially we're using this more of a, a formative type concept to get started, which I think is great uh, yep. to the students through these different platforms. Two questions. Are you planning to attack one platform at a time? So like ortho first, then neuro, then wound care, or are you trying to release these all at the same time? And then second question is, are you designing them to be comprehensive in nature? So when I think of a SIM, a SIM, is designed to do a certain thing, right? So is it a comprehensive head to toe evaluation that we're talking about with treatment? Or is it, are you planning to kind of like spotlight subjective exam, objective exam, or movement analysis or, or whatnot? I guess when you- when Most of the SIMs, most of the SIMs are built as, for the PTA SIMs, they are the return visit onwards and decision-making tied to that. And they'll be tied to different content areas. The neuro patient, the ortho patient, so acute care patient. The PT sims are typically tied to the full eval plus the return visit. So they're a little bit bigger. Um, and I would say the release pattern is, is unpredictable, unfortunately. So yes, actually the ortho sims guaranteed are going to start being released because I must use them in my class this fall. Nice. So the ortho sims will come faster. The neuro sims, like, there's less 
cases that we have to build, right? For acute care and for neuro. Maybe instead of 50 sims that I have to build for ortho, there may be 10 that I'm gonna build for cardiopalm slash acute care and eight that I'm gonna build for neuro. So those will all be, will start to come online, but I would consider it as not 2020, like 2021, throughout 2021, we're going to be building and testing. That's how long it takes to build this. I've been building all of our ortho sims since the beginning of the year. We're now in end of July. That's how long it takes. So I'm showing you this partly because I want you to be able to have a voice to reach out to me as you're thinking things through, as ideas pop out, you, you can begin to see what kind of things we can build, which may stimulate the ideas that you have so that we can now develop a conversation that you can be a part of, you can speak into this process. And, but, you know, you, you don't know when Apple's gonna release their iPhone 12. They've probably been building it. They probably have prototypes. Um, they have probably iPhone 14 already all planned out. Mm, but it's especially important because this is an academic tool for us to really be careful about how we release things. And so I think the Sims, the other Sims, Acute Care Neuro, you may begin to see pieces of them, like test versions coming out later, later part of this year. And then you'll begin to see the real product be flushing into the, to the PhysioU apps, uh, probably some, somewhere in mid 2021. So that's just the nature of the beast. It, they're, they're hard to build. No, I yeah, I completely understand it. the magnitude of doing this is, is huge, especially if you are trying to tackle it from a like a comprehensive standpoint of, like you said, an eval and an intervention. Right. Awesome, man. All right. Like you, you briefly made a, a allusion to Tony's question when you said that, you know, after the eval, then the second treatment or whatever, we'll bring in the PTA or whatever. And, you know, I was in an institution which had a PTA and a PT program, and very rarely, if ever, did we ever have collaborative, you know, kind of, teaching in that end. I mean, so this is very good that you can see how the PT student can learn how to use the PTA and PTA vice versa. And I can see down the road, visionary wise that, how about, you know, doing that interdisciplinary stuff? You know, oh yeah. That. That's and, all, you know, that's all really cool stuff. And I would just what's down the road for us. Yeah. I would just say that, you know, when you look at the PTA version, it basically starts as Jerry Maguire is waiting for you in the waiting room. Here's the soap note from the therapist. Here are the common questions that you should ask and their responses. Now, let's decide based on the improvements or changes in the questionnaire, are they making any changes? How's their disability? So there's a lot of this kind of stuff and little different parts of the decision making. This patient fell. And so now the, the PTA has to say, hey, I'm not sure if we should move forward yet. Let me call the primary therapist to make an assessment of whether to continue care or refer out. So there's a lot of these stories that I'm engaging with PTA faculty like Marcy, where we, where we can tease out all the common scenarios that you would usually use in your classroom and we can build them into the simulations. So yeah, that's, that's just a glimpse of the PTA version, but they will, they, the other thing I was just gonna say is you don't have to wait, the PTA, will actually greatly value and learn from the orthopedic sims that we're releasing. Imagine, because we're not asking to make really tough decisions. They get to see the flow of the exam. They get to see some, make some basic decisions. And then when they come to the part two, the, the return visit, it actually just, it's the same decisions that we're trying to make as a therapist as the assistant's trying to make. So I think, the PTA or, or the PT ortho sims that we're going to release first, those could easily, you don't have to worry actually that they're playing this through. You know, I, I think it actually may be very, very interesting for the students. Okay, so hey, I want to thank everybody for being a part of this conversation. Please feel free to reach out to me again at mike at physiou.com um, and looking forward to continue to be in touch with you and I'm wishing you the best as you're preparing for fall um, um, 
please feel free to reach out to me anytime. If you have comments or questions or need access to PhysioU and you're trying to figure out how to use it, I'm happy to, happy to show you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mike. All right. Hey, good to see you, brother. You too. All right. Hey, Tony. Hey, James. All right. How are you guys doing? You're good. Wow. Everybody's sporting the big hair. I've got to get on the train. <laughs> yeah, it's getting, getting out of control. It's the Sammy, COVID. Sammy, you look like you're playing third base for the Dodgers. It's got to <laughs> I forget the guy's name. He was on TV last night. They were playing the uh, John. Yeah. Uh, the one with COVID? <laughs> no. <laughs> Hopefully I don't have that in common with him. He's a, no, he's a, I forget his name. All yeah, right. This is, this is great, though, guys. I'm, I'm excited. I think it's going to be cool. Yeah. Yeah, we're working hard on it. Anything to help, Mike. Yeah. Um, one of the things I just thought would be, you know, we were just going over this with uh, one of my colleagues' intro to patient communication class about SINs. And I was actually trying to pull up an article where in a residency training program, they just had a really simple chart of identifying sins um, where, you know, low severity, high irritability. So maybe that would be an easy drag and drop kind of thing, too, after Absolutely. the severity interpretation, irritability interpretation from subjective and objective that they could just kind of drag and drop low irritability, high irritability, whatever. Yeah. Because I think that's difficult for the students to even just make that basic decision too after they have some information. And is this a moderate or is this a high or whatever? Yeah. But yeah, absolutely. The basic decision making with drag and drop. That's I love that idea. Yeah. Is and it, some you can see some, here, we've started to do that. Let me just share screen for a second. Like when you choose the wrong answer related to severity or irritability, we've created a little graph that says, hey, let's review what severity is or let's review what irritability is. Now go back and choose again. Yep. So that's one way to do it. And the other way to do it potentially is creating a drag and drop like please order. Um, well, I'm not sure drag and drops the right thing for irritability, really, because it's not like you're trying to drag things into a sequence. It's really just a decision like or you could create some kind of some kind of animation that you can drag the scale to higher irritability, you know, or something like that. But yeah, I, I get what you're saying. Yeah. And we are trying to solve that problem. How do students determine levels of irritability and can they can they actually interpret that high levels of irritability means reduced levels of testing means more careful with the movements of the patient. Um, means less aggression or the potential to place a patient in a pain control category, which would mean more positioning, more education and modalities perhaps, right? So that's, that's all floating around in my brain and we're trying different ways to, to get students to make that kind of decision in every case. So that's one of the reasons why I'm showing you the Sims is because in order to make building simulations actually manageable, you have to create a certain level of consistency within the sims. So I'm trying to create a production yeah. line. And that production line also needs to reflect a thought process that becomes ingrained in the way that students make, make decisions, how they gather information. All of that is being carefully thought through. Um, so yeah. Yeah, we are. We, yeah, we got that in mind. You're, uh, Mike. It's funny I put it on the chat, but you kind of stepped into the jurisprudence landmine when you mentioned about the PTA. You know, talking to primary therapists because there are some uh, legal uh, rules in terms of how they have to contact the PT and under what conditions. So it's kind of funny as you said that. I go, yep. There's a jurisprudence example. Yeah. So, yeah. Different silo, same concept, but it's funny. I mean, I. You know me, I'm going to be the health policy guy. Yeah, I think it's useful to to kind of take some of these nuanced decision-making issues and revisit them through the jurisprudence modules, right? Yeah. A lot yeah. of the modules that we built there are designed yeah. to put the students in those positions, exact positions where they have to go, is this appropriate for me to do or is this something that I should actually contact and do with my therapist? Like you are legally, uh, you're legally obligated to do it. I mean, and that's part of the questions they can have on a board exam, the jurisprudence exam. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So. Mike, this is Charlie Nichols. Uh, Hi, Charlie. How are, 
How would you address the, uh, or how are you building in the SIMS, the idea of prognosis? Because that seems to be an issue patients really have, or uh, students really have a problem with uh, learning to do is, you know, what's a good prognosis? What's a fair prognosis? So that's a that. great question, Charlie, and it's great to hear from you. It's been a while since we got together, but um, yes. I'm open to suggestions. I did not even put that. I mean, you could certainly wait until after the subjective, after some past medical history, and then do you think we should put a, a, a prognosis determination at that point? Or do you do a prognosis determination at the end of the full evaluation before you start treating? Where, where do you envision it? I kinda, I, we kind of envision it and use it as part of our kind of part of our uh, practicals is at the end of the objective. Uh, base, basically on the patient education part. Uh, we try, have them go through you know, the whole exam, then they have to do their goals and look at prognosis from that standpoint uh, and how they would educate the patient on how are they going to, you know, what, how long is this going to take? You know, do we feel like we're going to get complete resolution, partial resolution, whatever, you know, and trying to, trying to build that into them from a very simplistic standpoint because they yeah. really don't know anything. Right. I think you're right. So you make two great points. One is it, it would be powerful to put it at the end of the subject or at, at the end of the exam, so to speak. So you force them to stop and take in all the data that they've they, like this person is ready to get better. They're in a good environment where they can get better. And the problem is very musculoskeletal. And so they're right on track. So the, the options you give for that question, how is the patient's prognosis really cannot be that complicated. It's just like good or bad, maybe, <laughs> you know, like how do you determine moderate? But let's say it's good, moderate or, or poor, let's say something like that. Now, when they choose the right answer, you could create a slide that says, yes, you're right. The patient is on track for a full recovery because these five things, you know, and I'm not sure that we can define the right answer perfectly, but we could certainly make suggestions. This is why we think the patient's going to do well, or nope, that's incorrect. The patient actually has a poor prognosis because of their diabetes, because of their hypertension, because they live in an area where they cannot exercise. So you integrate the social determinants of health. And, um, you know, there's maybe that would be the way to do it is, is you have your two or three options and then you give a reasonable explanation. You give a reasonable explanation of why the prognosis is good or bad. Yeah, I like that. So yes, that's that's a great thought. Uh, I think Matt has had that written down. And um, Matt, if you'll note that Char Charlie had uh, brought that up so that when I'm confused, I can reach back out <laughs> to you, Charlie. Because <laughs> it's easy at this point for me to get completely lost. You know, uh, it's we've got so many of these different things happening, and um, and then of course planning my own course. Um, right. So. Yeah, it's a great point, Charlie. I, the prognosis thing is just not an easy thing. No, but, it's not. but maybe we make the cases simple enough, which is the cases were designed to be simple. I'm really not trying to make the complex patient yet. That should be version, that should be like 2021, end of 2021, we have complex patients, multiple systems patients. And, and then we make those cases as a way for them to really integrate, right? Because most of us have these types of courses where it's like, like Tony, we always talk about your multiple systems class. That's a great place for simulations because you typically will have more fragile patients. Uh, certainly you could make a bad decision and a patient could die in the simulation. There's nothing wrong with creating that level of severity based on some bad decisions. Um, so, uh, I will try to figure out, Charlie, if we can integrate that prognostic. Like we would have to create a new level in the 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 simulation builder that has okay everything funnels into this prognostic question, and then based on the prognosis question, maybe it doesn't change that much in the you know in the next part of the sim, but we 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 force a moment there for them to consider. And, and make some interpretations of the data. So I think it's a good idea.
So I got a, I got a quick idea for that, Mike. I think Charlie, you're right. I, I have the same struggle myself, and I think that's one of the hardest things to talk through in a class. So you know, with your drop and drag, I your drop, drag and drop, D and D idea. I think to to maybe have a simple way of keeping that theme and organizing what Charlie and, and all of us are trying to accomplish is you have your excellent, good, fair, poor prognosis is at the top, and then there's all these findings from your subjective and objective, like takes a bunch of medications, okay, poor. Um, you know, good general health is excellent, something like that, and they drag all these different things, and then would your algorithm be able to have like a conclusion like a equals fair at the end when they kind of line all those things up yeah you could do it on a case-by-case basis you could do it on a case-by-case basis so you could basically summarize a bunch of the key findings that drive the prognostic decision and then allow them to drag and drop what they think is relevant and when they drag and not drag and drop enough of them the right answers in it could take them to a slide that says, great, you, you recognize the relevant variables. This patient has a poor prognosis for recovery. I mean, that's a cool idea. I'm kind of thinking of, yeah, because I think that's what we all do in class anyway, is we say, okay, let's build the goods and bads to try to come up with this prognosis, being that it's very challenging. So if they can kind of do that on the, on the sim themselves, and then it equates to something, you know, something basic, good or bad, like you said. Right. I think that would possibly steer them in a direction. Yeah. So, idea, Charlie. Yeah. Great, guys. Hey, I've got to run to another Zoom meeting. I imagine all of you do too. So, thank you so much. Uh, please be in touch. And good to see all of you, Charlie, um, you know, Tony, and, and, and Sam, all the, all, everybody. So, take care, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thanks, guys. Take care. Thanks, Matt.